1st of May, 1965, an American plane designated YF-12A set four world records. One for sustained altitude and three for speed, including a mark of 2,070 miles per hour. While the achievement was hailed in Washington, it did not add any joy to the annual May Day festivities in Moscow. Following the high-profile record-setting flight, the aircraft receded into its customary obscurity. Record-breaking has been the public face of one of history's most mysterious families of aircraft, the Lockheed Blackbirds. These planes were so ahead of their time that radical new methods and materials were developed to build them. The technology they employed and their achievements astounded even the experts of the day. The Blackbirds were so far ahead of their time that they seemed unreal. The planes, and in fact the entire program, was so secret that their existence had not even been suspected. In February 1964, when President Johnson officially revealed the existence of the plane, the experts were astonished and the general public uncomprehending. The confusion was further heightened when the president mistakenly referred to the plane as the A-11, when in fact it was the A-12. Further confusion arose when photos of the wrong plane, a fighter version under development, were circulated. Four months later, a third aircraft in the family, the SR-71, was announced. The world's first aircraft to cruise at speeds above Mach 3 came from Lockheed, in a series of proposals for a high-speed, high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft. Limited approval to develop the 12th of these submissions was given, hence the number A-12. The date was the 29th of August, 1959. On the 30th of January, 1960, an order was placed for 12 examples. Literally everything on the aircraft would have to be invented from scratch, right down to the paint and the first flight would take place only two and a half years later. The original concept gave rise to four models. Following the reconnaissance A-12 version, the design appeared as a long-range interceptor for the Aerospace Defense Command, called the YF-12. The refined reconnaissance version the SR-71 emerged in 1961. There has also been a smaller espionage drone version, the D-21, which is still almost totally shrouded in official secrecy. The security surrounding these planes over the years is not in any way surprising. They have been centers for the most secret activity, and as a result, have been secrets themselves. Facts about them have been part of an envelope of carefully controlled information. For example, the records they sacked in 1965 were no reflection of their full capability. The figures were simply sufficient to be radically new marks. This was suspected by some at the time, and demonstrated later. The planes have shown more of their capacity and set new records since. Typically deceptive, the program to develop the Blackbirds was given the code name Oxford obviously conjuring up a mental image of lumbering wooden wheels in a slow, lurching motion. An ironic reference, given the abilities of these planes. Some figures about the aircraft are available. 
An SR-71 is 107 feet long. Its wingspan is 55 feet, and it stands over 18 feet high. It carries no armaments. Instead, its payload was made up of cameras and sensors. Empty, it weighed over 67,000 pounds, and its maximum takeoff weight was given as over 172,000. It could speed along with its 3,500 pounds of reconnaissance equipment for an unrefueled range of 3,250 miles. However, figures are not necessarily facts. They serve more, perhaps, as guidelines. For example, the 32 SR-71s were built, in all likelihood, is correct. But it is really only a confirmation that at least that number were built. The Blackbirds originated at the beginning of the Cold War from political needs in an era of growing uncertainty. Ironically, they reflected the danger of security. The unease generated by the Soviets' nuclear capability demanded more intelligence gathering. An absence of facts always encourages speculation, and speculation concerning the bomb has a tendency to generate paranoia. President Eisenhower promoted an open skies policy to permit reconnaissance overflights. The Soviets declined. However, the proposal was not simply a polite inquiry. It was also an effective declaration of intent. The U.S. would be taking a look at whatever was there, no matter what the residents might think. The nuclear stakes were seen as too high to permit any other course. All that was needed was a plane to do the job. In the early 1950s, the United States had a real requirement to overfly Russia to find out the status of their development of long-range missiles. There was no airplane in the United States or in the world that could safely overfly Russia at that time. Lockheed made an unsolicited proposal to Trevor Gardner, the Undersecretary for Research and Development for the Air Force, uh, on a very specialized airplane. We promised to build within eight months uh, 20 airplanes for $22 million, including spares, that would do the job required. The program was turned over to the CIA, who then chose Mr. Richard Bissell, an economist, to run the program. Richard Bissell became a very good engineer, and he not only was our director on the U-2 program, but he also followed through with the development of the Mach 3 Blackbird. When I first met Kelly, I had been working for nearly a year for Alan Dulles. I joined uh, Alan's organization early in 1954. Toward the end of November, I was summoned one afternoon into Alan's office. And I was told, with absolutely no prior warning or knowledge, that one day previously, President Eisenhower, President Eisenhower had approved a project involving the development of an extremely high altitude aircraft to be used for surveillance and intelligence collection over denied areas in Europe, Russia, and elsewhere. We had, on the basis of Kelly's proposal, an almost impossible schedule to meet. It was almost impossible for Lockheed, but I can assure you that it was also an extremely tight schedule working within the bureaucracy. The mission of the plane to overfly the USSR dictated several things. First, it would have to fly very high to be outside the range of interceptors and anti-aircraft weapons. It would also need a very long range. There would obviously be no fuel stops en route. These two aims complemented each other. Being out of range, the plane did not need to go particularly fast and could cruise economically. The shape which emerged was that of a glider with extraordinarily large high aspect wings and reflecting an obsession with weight conservation. The prototype arrived at the Groom Lake test site on the 29th of July, 1955. Kelly Johnson's impossible, self-imposed schedule was met. 
the plane flew on time. As part of the secrecy, the designation U-2 was intended to give nothing away. The U stood ambiguously for utility. In fact, the U-2 has performed many roles in addition to its primary espionage function. And the word utility has proved, over time, to actually be a fair description. The U-2 is a demanding plane to fly. There are many things about maneuvering this powered glider in extremely thin air at great altitude that are not applicable to flying any other aircraft. For example, at altitude there is only a very narrow envelope between its stall speed and its entry into transonic flight, the point at which supersonic airflow over the wings begins. In the U-2 at 70,000 feet, these two points were about 12 knots apart. Below 400 knots, you would fall out of the sky looking for denser air. Above 412 knots, your wings might come off. This is a very restricting slot to occupy. Over the years, with increased load and more powerful engines, the gap actually narrowed to less than 5 miles per hour. Given the stresses of the missions and the fragile nature of the planes, Kelly Johnson did not expect the U-2 to have a long lifespan, particularly when the frustrated Soviets concentrated their attention on knocking it down, as they most certainly would. However, the design has proved to be enduring, and the very unusual step was taken in 1979 of restarting production. And the plane was rechristened the TR-1. The TR-1 maintains the design and abilities of the U-2. The aircraft that Kelly Johnson's team produced provided a solution that is as valid today as it was in 1954. Optical cameras are no longer the primary loads of U-2s or TR-1s, which now fly electronic and communications intelligence missions using their high flying capability and small size. But these technological spying measures were not the original reason for the U-2s. And in the 50s, that reason, to overfly Russian territory, carrying cameras and taking photos was a priority. But as the likelihood of the Russians developing weapons to shoot U-2s down increased, so did the urgency of replacing them. A new plane was needed, one that could fly much faster. If one was no longer protected by being out of range of interception, then one needed to be able to outrun it. About a year after that first flight in, 50, in 1956, uh, I came to the conclusion that we should start working on the successor to the U-2 because it was clear to me that sooner or later the U-2 would be vulnerable to interception. It was not a matter of simply commissioning the final design and production of an aircraft that was within, although at the edge of the state of the art, as had been the case with the U-2. This time, it was a real a really pioneering effort. The U-2's replacement was equipped with four large equipment bays to handle a wide range of specialized reconnaissance and surveillance gear. Mission equipment included side-looking radar, a terrain objective camera, two operational objective cameras, 
two technical objective cameras, and infrared mapping, mission recorders, and an EMR system. The airframe is essentially a blended body and delta wing built around two huge engines. The long forward fuselage performs a number of aerodynamic functions. Its flat profile helps the Blackbird achieve a low radar visibility while retaining plenty of room for fuel and payload. The chines on the fuselage effectively make it act as a lifting surface and help improve directional stability. The enormous engines are positioned midway out on the wing and are housed in the cells that have unique intake systems to control airflow. This is a critical factor in generating the plane's amazing power. Because of the Blackbird's speed, its wings are very thin, and a large part of their area is taken up with a honeycomb of fuel storage. But most of the fuel is carried in five tanks that occupy the majority of the fuselage. It's worth noting that in 1958, when the plane was first being developed, even the most advanced fighter designs of the day were flat out at Mach 2. They had ranges and operating ceilings that were hopelessly short of the espionage requirement. Everything about this new plane would be revolutionary. There would be new materials for the aircraft's parts, and even the machines to make the materials and parts would have to be developed from scratch. Lockheed had some experience with titanium fabrication, but this would be only a starting point for the metals needed for the job. The plane would have to withstand very high temperatures for long periods. Different areas of the skin would be between 800 and 1100 degrees Fahrenheit at Mach 3. As a result, despite the expense of the material and the research and development costs of inventing it, around 93% of the plane is composed of a titanium alloy. Of course, metals designed to operate under extreme conditions require even more extreme conditions to fabricate. Some of the major parts had to be shaped in a huge press designed to operate at 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. No such press existed before the need for parts for the Blackbird. So, it had to be developed. In fact, the company would go through countless experimental processes in developing the aircraft. Many samples were produced, but the standards to be met were so rigid that a high proportion were rejected. Eventually, parts of reliable strength and integrity were produced, but only after much anxious trial and error and an undisclosed but presumably very large expenditure. Hot forging of the metal in special ovens and presses was only the first step in the processing. These shapes were in effect rough outlines of the parts. The forgings then had to be machined to extremely fine tolerances. The milling machines were advanced designs. Tape controlled early robots with special cutters developed by Lockheed to handle the metal. The cutting fluid was new too. One of its features had to be that it would not corrode the titanium alloy. At each step of this plane's development, everything was either new or specifically adapted, right down to the smallest factors and the most routine processes. Finished parts then moved into sub-assembly processes. Once again, everything was affected. Spot welders had to be specially adapted. Normal tools had to be recast in different metal. Nothing could be taken for granted. 
Early in the project, Kelly Johnson offered $50 to any one of his staff who could come up with an easy problem to solve. The impish humor barely disguises the core truth in the offer. The designers had to develop the aircraft in the abstract. Their function was, as much as possible, to foresee the implications of each consideration and to follow them until each problem had been identified and solved. They did this without the aid of digital equipment. They did it in the main with slide rules, pens, and bits of paper. There were many problems that arose, either unseen or half appreciated, during the course of early production. And there were flaws in the original A-12s that were dealt with in later models. However, the project ran very smoothly. And the success of the design team has remained a pinnacle of engineering achievement, despite the passage of years. Each Blackbird came together as a series of sub-assemblies, with each of the major fuselage and wing components being produced in two sections. In part, this system was developed to save as many man-hours and as much assembly space as possible. Not only would the skin of the plane be subjected to extreme heat, the same applied to the interior. Wiring, which could be relied on at 900 degrees, had to be developed. The problems and solutions went on. Of course, no matter how good something looks in theory, there's always a need for more practical reassurance. A full-scale static test program was conducted. The kind of aerodynamic loads the aircraft would experience in flight were hydraulically forced, and the integrity of the design was studied. Individual components were also tested to destruction. Wheel assemblies were subjected to violent landings and various lateral stresses to test not only the landing gear, but also the tires and the brakes. On the 30th of September, 1964, the YF-12 became the first of the Blackbirds to be presented to the press. It can safely be assumed that no one turned down an invitation voluntarily. In aviation, this was the story of the day. During the presentation, journalists were able to study the plane at close quarters, meet its makers, and watch a demonstration of the aircraft in flight. As with many things about the Blackbird, it's difficult to determine where the plane's original concept came from. Kelly Johnson said that at times the early work began as a long-range interceptor, a role the YF-12 was expected to fill. Johnson was adamant that the submission was a serious contender for a fighter contract and not merely a cover for intelligence planes. The YF-12's obvious external difference was the cutaway of the chines at the nose to accommodate radar needs. To compensate for the loss of stability caused by the cut-down chines, small ventral fins were added under the engine nacelles, along with another larger central fin which was lowered once the plane was airborne. The interception fighter's function is to catch something and shoot it down. When the fighter is flying faster than a bullet, guns are not of much use. 
rockets capable of launch at Mach 3 did not exist in 1960. So once again, something had to be invented because of the Blackbirds. The Hughes developed missile system for the YF-12 would later be reborn as the Phoenix system of the Grumman F-14 Tomcat because the big black plane was never adopted as a long-range interceptor. As a sole function aircraft, it simply did not fit the prevailing mood. Many people were astonished at the decision, for if the requirement had been solely for an interceptor, then surely here was the plane. However, politically, it reflected the wrong philosophy. Resentment over the decision lingered for many years. Now, coming to the YF-12 and, and the SR-71, I guess perhaps the, the unique thing, the real unique thing about those two airplanes, unhappily, is we built the wrong one. Unhappily, is we built the wrong one. We built the SR-71, which undoubtedly is the finest airplane that has ever been built. But in terms of what the need for this country was at that particular time, I think Kelly will agree with this, we built the wrong airplane. Today, we don't have an interceptor that can really bear the name of interceptor. And here's an airplane that 14 years ago was exceeding all the world speed and altitude records. Even today, in the form of the, of the SR-71, is a considerably greater airplane than anything we have. But we needed an interceptor, and we didn't get it. Kelly Johnson had to accept with some bitterness that this masterpiece would not be produced in significant numbers. Only a few would ever be built, and they would be shrouded in the most effective security possible. Limiting manufacture to the SR-71 reconnaissance version ensured the mystery of the Blackbird, whereas the more public role of a fighter version might have allowed the crescendo of worldwide acclaim that the achievement warranted. The SR-71 was announced by President Johnson on July 24, 1964. It came as somewhat of a surprise to Lockheed because the SR-71 was supposed to be the RS-71 or the R-71. The R stood for reconnaissance and the S ambiguously for strike. However, it was decided that the President's name would stick as standing for strategic reconnaissance. The SR-71 took off for its first flight on December 22, 1964. The flight was a complete success. Everything worked, and the pilots and mechanics were happy with the aircraft. The flight testing program proceeded well, most major problems having already been sorted out during the experience of the A-12 and YF-12 projects. The SR-71 progressed to acceptance tests at Edwards Air Force Base on August 13, 1965, and proceeded smoothly through testing and into service. Enough information about the Blackbirds continued to seep out to ensure that they became one of the most famous secrets in the world. Aircraft enthusiasts came to know enough about the plane and its capabilities to develop an appreciation of the achievement it represented. Then, in September 1974, the Farnborough Air Show received a very special visitor.
The SR-71 had flown from New York to London in one hour, 54 minutes, 56.4 seconds. Needless to say, this was a record. Aviation enthusiasts turned into fans, and film processors made a small fortune. Whenever the SR-71 turned up at an air show, it attracted a large crowd on its own. In fact, even the unfounded rumor that one would show up led to good crowds. The SR-71 spent so little time in public that this was understandable. On its way back to the U.S. after the 1974 Farnborough show, the SR-71 set another record, London to Los Angeles in three hours and 48 minutes. This included rendezvous for refueling in flight. In terms of local times, it arrived about four hours before it took off. Among other records claimed by the Blackbird was the flight on the 26th of April, 1971, which covered 15,000 miles in 10 and a half hours nonstop. This was the equivalent of San Francisco to Paris and back. The U.S. Air Force flew its SR-71s with the 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing, based at Beale Air Force Base in Northern California. They received their first Blackbirds in January 1966. In the next 24 years, they flew thousands of long-distance missions. Regular deployments were made to bases around the world. And flights covered most of the world's surface. Only top-of-the-line pilots were eligible to fly the SR-71. Requirements were about the same as for the astronaut program. There were no shortages of applicants for the job, however. fancy escape capsules built into the aircraft. Kelly Johnson figured that the spacesuit the pilot wore was already an adequately controlled environment, and he concentrated on how to get the pilot clear of the plane at Mach 3. The ejection seat and parachutes inevitably had to be specially developed. Of course, there is no real way to test such an escape system. Obviously, you cannot simply take a Blackbird up to Mach 3 at 80,000 feet and shoot the crew out. At some point in the process, you have to accept whatever can be proved in adequate tests and deduce the rest. heights and speeds, what was achievable could at best be only partially guaranteed. Over the years, at least 11 SR-71s were lost for various reasons, and several crewmen died. troublesome to maintain and became progressively more expensive to keep flying. Each airframe had its own personality, a fact that pilots became very aware of. This may in part be due to the nature of the metal. Kelly Johnson asserted that each flight above Mach 3 would effectively retemper the alloy, theoretically giving the planes the strength to go on forever. However, coupled with what was essentially hand construction, this also gave each plane its own characteristics. 
pilot instruction called for a special training variant. The SR-71 was a plane unlike any other, and simulators and other training aids were little preparation for the real thing. The trainer sat in a second cockpit, stepped above the normal clean lines of the airframe. It was cramped and afforded little view, but there was only so much that could be done to the shape. There was only so much that could be done to the shape without losing supersonic ability. To give an example, the A-12 trainer, nicknamed the Titanium Goose, was not even capable of flight at Mach 2, far short of the standard aircraft's ability. Most of the serious candidates for the job of SR-71 pilot had logged over 3,000 flying hours. There were around three jobs a year, and one can only guess at the number of applicants. One pilot, Colonel Robert Powell, was to log a total of 1,020 hours flying the SR-71. This meant that he had more hours in his logbook at above Mach 3 than any other pilot in the world. In those hours, he flew over a million miles, he also earned 17 air medals and two distinguished flying crosses. Kelly Johnson led a team of designers that produced a string of remarkable aircraft. From the Second World War P-38 through the P-80, F-104, U-2 and the Blackbird family, his workshop became the most celebrated aviation think tank of all time. The designs produced were always adventurous, but practical assessments of the problem to be overcome. As an engineer, he was courageous, and as a team leader, he was a dynamo. He expounded simple virtues in a world of complicated considerations. It appears to have been his belief that his greatest achievements were in getting the best out of his subordinates. His only experience in supersonic flight came in the A-12 trainer. For the father of so many remarkable aircraft designs, this was surely an experience he would savor for many years. Kelly Johnson would probably have preferred a trip in each Blackbird. Wouldn't we all? It is not surprising that there were so many applicants for the job of pilot. It is also not surprising that the criteria were exclusive. Selection for the training took about a year. Special care was taken to weed out Top Gun types. SR-71 operations required a steady, team-oriented temperament that was as important as a security clearance. The ability to manage the systems correctly and constantly was given as much weight as flying ability. At over 30 miles per minute, there is not much piloting to do once a mistake has been made. No one could be allowed to fly one of these birds like a cowboy. A critical key to the Blackbirds had been the development of a fuel that would not burn simply because of the heat in the tanks, which, like the rest of the plane, got very hot at high speed. In addition, unlike virtually any other fuel, it had to be burnable at extreme altitude. Once the fuel had been developed, other problems seemed small by comparison. Soon after each takeoff, the plane refueled. In some aspects, blackbirds are quite basic. To allow for the expansion of the skin at Mach 3 heat, there are corrugations, like an old Ford trimotor. In addition, to save weight and complexity, the skins are also the fuel tanks. 
fuel actually leaks from an SR-71 constantly until it heats up, expands, and seals the tanks. And once hot, they stay hot. Even after a Blackbird lands, it is unwise to touch it because you may burn your hand. Time did not pass these planes by. Admittedly, the pilots continued to face a traditional array of round dials, but the surveillance system cockpit became home to a procession of advanced technologies. As computers became smaller, the functional capabilities of these big spies increased. They already presented the peak of operational capabilities. An SR-71 can survey 100,000 square miles of territory per hour. That has been a fact for a very long time. What it can glean from that area in that hour has, during its lifetime, increased considerably. When work on the Blackbirds first started, a basic fact to be accepted was that normal tools, which are coated in cadmium, would cause corrosion of the titanium alloy. Normal tools were out. This aircraft was a major step forward, and everything changed. Or did it? Kelly Johnson probably thought that he was starting a new technological race, that the next generation of aircraft worldwide would be blackbirds of some sort or another, that the next step to higher speeds or perhaps more refined maneuverability would push past the new marks that his masterpiece had created. But that was not the way it went. The Russians developed small bands of high-speed, limited-range fighters, which were, in large part, drones, because their weapon systems were controlled from the ground. The pilot's only real function was to land and take off the aircraft and try to get the fighter in close proximity to its target. Apart from Soviet attempts at interceptors, Kelly Johnson's masterwork continued to rule the skies. What the CIA and U.S. Air Force did with them remains very secret. But there is enough information about their operational parameters and the equipment they could carry for one to spend hours in informed speculation about what they actually did. Back when Kelly Johnson's design team set to work on the problem of a U-2 replacement, they studied anything that could be considered a possibility. Among their early work was a proposal for a hydrogen-powered space aircraft, which Johnson described as a big flying vacuum bottle. This was well outside the technical ability of the time and was dropped. The plane that evolved bore no resemblance to a vacuum bottle, super sleek, futuristic, the A-12. It should also have been outside the technical feasibility of its era, but has flown into history as one of the greatest achievements in engineering and one of the greatest aircraft ever constructed. By 1990, the Air Force was paying a reported $400 million a year to keep its 20 SR-71s operational. And Congress decided this was too much. The allocation was canceled. The Blackbirds were doomed. They had spent their entire career in secret, and, and the immensely high cost of developing them was probably their best kept secret. Sometime in the next century, information about them may be released. Until then, much about the SR-71 
remains a mystery. The last SR-71 flight on March 6, 1990, was a fitting end to the story. The plane flew from California to Washington in 68 minutes, 17 seconds. The flight was another record. There has been no other plane like the Blackbird. There probably never will be. If a major factor in establishing the greatness of an achievement is to compare it with its contemporaries, to what do we compare the Blackbird? Certainly nothing else in 1958 vintage, and nothing that has been produced since. The Blackbird stands alone and is probably the greatest aircraft ever built. That at least, is not a secret. <laughs>